Well, I guess I'm part. I guess I'm uh, gonna. I'm up first. Uh, uh, Sabrina uh, will follow with the Juro Spider. I'm the spot spotted, spotted lantern fly guy. Um, I'm gonna share my screen here and uh, let's get this thing rolling. Um, all right, play from start. Hopefully, y'all can see and uh what 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 we're looking at and okay so my name's richard buckley i'm from rutgers uh university plant diagnostic laboratory um what we do in our lab is uh uh solve plant problems for people um lab laboratory started uh uh we took our first samples july 7th 1991 um and so i'm just about to finish my 32nd year uh of uh uh in in the job i have uh sabrina uh came to the lab uh from the undergrad program and has been with us for uh 25 years and so together we've uh evaluated more than 60,000 plants for disease and insect pest diagnosis um uh we are associated with uh federal and state regulatory agencies um, you know, that help track and uh, eradicate, if, if possible, um, species of concern, um, disease agents, insect pests, um, weeds um, that, you know, move into the country uh, inadvertently or, you know, sometimes on purpose um, uh, that, that have a threat to, you know, the, the native flora and fauna in, 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 in our area. Um, and so, so who you see on the front on the first slide here on my cover is a is a, a person named Tiffany Morrow, and uh, she is a federal regulator, and her job is the uh, Spot Lantern Fly Program Director for the Mid Atlantic Region, and she she works for APHIS, the Animal Plant Health Inspection Service, and Plant Protection and Quarantine. And uh, she's an important person in, spot, in the spot and lanternfly world, but uh, she's on the cover here because she paints her fingernails like the insects that she's tracking and eradicating, and she has spotted lanternfly fingernails. Um, so, uh, so, so anyway, uh, so the question that that I hope you have is, um, what is a spotted lanternfly? And and so spotted lanternflies are insects with piercing sucking mouth parts they're true bugs in the order hemiptera and so that order um you know has a, a number of different things we've we've heard about stink bugs some of you may know what stink bugs are of course cicadas a couple of years ago we had this periodical cicadas which were, were awesome um and then we have uh uh you know the soft bodied insects you know aphids uh, psyllids and, and and scales and and those kinds of things. And so the, the, this is this is a rather large group of insects. Um, all of them um, have piercing sucking mouth parts. Um, so they suck plant sap, you know, from plant cells in the epidermis or from the xylem and phloem, the, the nutrient or water conducting tissues, you know, inside the plants. Um, and, and in this group. There are a lot of plant pests, you know, significant agricultural issues and that sort of thing. But the 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 the, the lantern flies are in a family of insects in this group that we call plant hoppers. And, and the name of the family is called Fulgoridae. Of course, I I learned it, it was called flat flatidae. And and uh interestingly enough, if you hear me say the call it by the wrong name. Um, it's just because I can't, can't help myself. You know, it was called that way when I learned it. And the, the researchers changed, changed the name over time. So we're, we're going to look at the plant hoppers a little bit to get to get going, just to give you an idea. Um, you know, most of the plant hoppers in the United States and in New Jersey are relatively benign insects that don't do a whole lot of damage to the plants. Most of them have broad wings. Note that they're held uh, parallel uh, over the body, um, kind of tent-like. Um, they have uh, uh, juvenile forms that are called nymphs. Um, you know, their life cycle is what we call parametabolic life cycle. And that, that means, you know, there's an egg and there's a nymph stage that gradually changes as it molts or loses its, it, its, 
its uh, 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 exoskeleton and grows and ultimately molting into an adult with wings and reproductive parts. And so the nymphs of this uh, uh, insect uh, uh, have a waxy tail. Now the wax is a waste product, you know, from eating plant plant cell saps. They so they uh, you know uh, walk around uh, with a little poo hanging off them. But 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 again, it's a, a it's a characteristic that you may see um, in in your landscape. Plat, you know, we we occasionally see them, and you can see here there's a nymph uh, uh, and and an adults the the, the green adults blend in with their with their plant host and you see the nymph with a little wax on the back um in this university of california photograph um here's some flatteds um that you know, there there's the wrong name again uh, photographs that sabrina took in madagascar um yeah i stole her photos but they're too cool not to share and uh, uh you know they're colorful insects with with flat or straight wings that you know flatted bug flat wings uh you know uh, I, I think that name's better even though we've changed it um hell tent like over the body piercing sucking mouth parts and so when you see the full gourds or the flatted in your lawn and landscape what you're likely to see is is the nymph face and and you know the waxy filaments of waste product that they're producing when they eat the plant sap, you know, these insects that eat plant sap have to eat a lot of it to get their nutrition. You know, I often, I often say, you know, it's like drinking beer for your sustenance, you know, uh, the more beer you drink, the more waste you make. And, and so, you know, these guys have to eat a lot of plant sap to get their, uh, uh, carbohydrates and their amino acids. And, and so they, the piercing sucking insects make a lot of waste product and you're going to you're going to hear about that a little bit more as, as we go along but again this is something typical it's not going to do much damage to this rose you know maybe aesthetics uh uh but but it, it, they're not it, they're not it's not an insect that's going to kill you know you may find this in your perennials or you know if you have an english garden small woodies and that sort of stuff um it's not uncommon in those situations now the one we're concerned about today is called uh, spotted lanternfly. Like so, the insect like Horma delicatula. I can't even say it, delicatula. And and so uh, uh, you know I should practice my Latin. And and so this is an insect that came into the country in 2014. It's native to uh, uh, Southeast Asia. Um, you know, as far west as India, um, as far east, it's established in Japan. It's a significant pest in Korea. Um, it's very likely uh, uh, native to China, um, but but we, we're not we're not a hundred percent sure of that. But in that region, there's there there are a, a lot of problems with it. It has a really wide host range. Um, there's at least seventy plants on the host list. Um, it does like fruit producing plants, uh, thin bark plants. It likes uh, trees, you know, with uh, a lot of turgor pressure. That means trees that move a lot of water through them, you know, and, and so, uh, you know, you, you'll find them uh, uh, on things like maple. And, and again, we'll, we'll, we'll expand this, the host list a little bit as we move forward. But, but one of the trees that they like a lot is called the tree of heaven. And uh, Tree of Heaven is an invasive tree from Southeast Asia. So, uh, you know, uh, we, we're, not, we're not completely sure um, if these insects have to feed on Tree of Heaven in order to reproduce, but we do find high concentrations, uh, particularly of the adults on the Tree of Heaven. So this insect has moved around the country and we've tracked it. And, and this is just a slide of, of, of uh, you know, the federal and the state regulators, the APHIS PPQ folks on the left, and Saul Vassiunas, who's from the State Department of Ag, uh, uh, the Co uh, Cooperative Agriculture Pest Survey Group, and that's me there in from the back, walking toward one of the quarantine zones in one of the first areas that we found this insect up in Warren County along the Delaware River, right? And so I just wanted to let, let you know, kind of illustrate the fact that's a multi-agency effort to try to track 
and control and eradicate these things. And it's an interesting thing because we do this with a lot of insects. And when it works really well, you guys never hear about it. And when we don't get our our self ourselves together you know we can't contain the insect i'm um, suddenly you know i'm talking to the somerset county libraries about it you know uh, and and this one uh it moves pretty readily and it got loose and and so we have problems with it and so the distrib distribution map and this is the the uh, uh most recent distribution map um from the new york state integrated pest management um uh, program website you will see that this insect has moved into several states. Um, you know, 2014, we're looking at, uh, 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 you know, nine years worth of distribution. And that's a pretty significant movement there. You see the red lines around the outside of, of a number of these counties, you know, down in Virginia and up around the, and that's the federal quarantine zone. And the federal quarantine zone in implies that there are um certain things you can't move in and out right we, it, there's a restriction on moving things and again it's something we'll come come to as we get along um but but again th this this map grows every year um you know every time it comes out i see a couple more counties on it um from from uh, december to march the counties in Connecticut started to fill in this area, starting to fill in blue here, north of us. So, so, so again, you know, a lot of this stuff depends on people seeing and reporting, uh, but uh, this insect has spread dramatically. Um, this is a map that uh, uh, we think um, will show the all the long term distribution of the insect. You know, so you're looking at an area through the transition zone. Here, what what I would mean, you know, uh, between the north and the south, uh, where where you got the hot spots, and and again, New Jersey's right in, at at the same latitude here, you know, weather wise and plant wise, um, to to support this insect. So so uh, you know, we all expect it to to exploit its entire range, and 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 fill in, you know, all the counties over time in this area in New Jersey. We do have it in every county now. Um, you see the quarantine zone in red. That quarantine zone as of February 1st includes the whole state. So New Jersey is in the whole, it, 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 the entire state is in, in, in uh, the quarantine zone. I thought it was pretty interesting sit, sitting on the beach last summer and having lanternflies land on me you know, at the beach. And I thought, well, if they're at the beach, they're everywhere else now too. Um, and we've been seeing them in the state for 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 about five years, um, you know, again, uh, uh, up near Warren uh, at first and gradually move moving east. Um, you know, interestingly enough, early in the epidemic, they kept finding them uh, dead ones in Atlantic City. You know, the folks from southeast Pennsylvania, where they were first found driving the Atlantic City Expressway you know and and they are caught on the on the bumpers and and windshields of cars and they're in the parking garages outside the borgata you know so so it's a kind of an interesting thing um how these things move and and, and again we'll kind of come back to that so this is a tree of heaven um it, it looks like a sumac a little bit um but but th these things you know you see that they're really good weed trees they do a great job growing in really kind of unsuitable conditions. So you see them, you know, uh, uh, you know, I, I'll talk to, I always tell people they grow, grow in the cracks in the Holland tunnel or something, but you see them along roadways and waste areas and they invade the forest. And, and I, you know, honestly, before the spotted lantern fly, I thought most of them were small like this. But I was in wooded areas in Warren County where these trees are quite large. I mean, they grow into huge 60 foot trees. And uh, uh, again, it's an invasive species and, 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 and the insect favors that. I, I would say that's its favorite food, you know? And so, so uh, um, other trees or other hosts that uh, um, we find these on, um, you can see there in, in red. And, and again, there's like 70 plants um, you can see up in red, the ones that we, we think they favor, you know, if you give them uh, you know, some of the researchers will put 
different trees into cages, right? And then let lantern flies loose in there. And then over time, see which trees they wind up on, you know, like feeding preferences and that sort of stuff. And so tree of heaven, um, things like uh, uh, roses, um, grapes are particularly susceptible. Um, black walnuts, you know, are, are, are natives and in the wood, you know, in, in the wooded areas and, and, and forested areas in, in, in the area. Um, and, and maples, you know, maples are, are re really uh, 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 suitable hosts for, for this, um, you know, but again, you see a lot of uh, 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 the kind of uh, uh, trees that you may have in your, in, in, you know, a lot of New Jersey landscapes, you know, uh, uh, oak for sure, sycamores, you know, uh, uh, some of the things like dogwood and crab apple and, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, cherries are real common, you know, spring flowering trees and that sort of thing. So, so, you know, there's a pretty wide host range here. Um, but, but again, you know, when given a choice, you know, if there's a maple, they're going to the maple. And so you look at data from, from Penn state and, and, uh, um, the first person to see one of these is a, is a county agricultural agent um, in, in, in the Penn State system. Her name is Emily Swachhammer. And Emily and, and a guy named Brian Walsh um, have, have been looking at this from the beginning. And, and one, of the, one of the projects that Brian did, it was just a survey, um, you know, for host preference. And, and so they looked at 200 trees in a tenth of a mile radius around in a shopping center area. 31% of the trees were red maples, but 94% of the lantern flies were on the maples, right? So, so again, you know, there's a lot of trees here from the list that we just looked at, you know, but, but they like maples better, you know, and, and, and you guys are, are kind of the same way too, you know, I, I'm pretty sure that you might like mashed potatoes better than peas or something like that. So, so, so again, you know, this, this insect has a strong host preference. We, we, we kind of assume that it's because the trees are thin barked. And again, they're trees with, with high turgor pressure that move a lot of water through them. And, and this insect depends on water moving through the plant to get its food. Right. And, and, and so, so they're passive feeders. And, and so, they will select trees with higher turgor pressure and, and feeding behavior by them. And you see this picture uh, from one of our colleagues, Steve Retke. Um, Steve is the New Jersey IPM, uh, nursery IPM guy. He goes out and scouts nurseries. And, and uh, uh, you know, if, if you have enough of them, you can deplete the, the turgor, you know, which means water pressure, um, uh, and, and that'll stress trees. Now, you know, um, talking to some of my Penn State colleagues, they say they see occasional maples with dot branch dieback, but we we don't have a lot of good evidence that it's it's it, it's the it's the lantern fly that's doing it. The lantern fly may add a stress to the tree and the tree may may die or die back because it's in a poor site or because you know it's hot or you know some other condition. You know, with shade trees, it's hard to kill them. And it's usually cumulative effects. You know, even if the lantern fly can't kill it outright, it does add a stress to to the to the overall health of the tree. Right now, with grapes, um, we have documented a significant impact on grapes, up to ninety percent yield loss. Um, you know, they're looking at other small fruits. The blueberry growers are quite concerned about it, um, but but uh, uh, you know in the landscape, we think it's, it's going to be a nuisance. Right. And, and, and it, honestly, for the grape growers, our New Jersey, uh, fruit, uh, uh, entomologists, um, she, uh, suggested that in grapes, um, in order to keep them free of spotted lantern flies, they have to use insecticides three more times than they usually use during the season. Right. So, so, you know, you think about that, well, we, one, we want to use as little insecticide as possible. So we're, we're always doing research or we're working on programs to try to reduce the amount of in insecticide. So this insect is, is causing us to increase, which, which is, is, is one, it's an environmental concern, right. And two, it's a cost for the grower. And, and so, you know, your New Jersey wine might cost a little bit more um, than, than it did a couple of years ago. 
um, because there's three additional uh, costly insecticide sprays on on the on the grapes before they get made into wine. So so again, you know, there there is an economic impact here, but but again, it's it, it's 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 pretty well defined and it's pretty small, you know, in these production agriculture situations rather than in the landscape. Now the 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 insects kind of move around a, a bit these things they, they crawl and, I, and again i'll start showing showing you uh, pictures of of the life cycle and stuff as we go along they crawl they move quite a bit they hop really and and it, it, it's it's kind of cool i mean you know hopefully you're not you're not skeeved by by a, a whole bunch of insects um uh i you know, Spreed and I think it's kind of fun, you know, and, and you go into them, they're hopping all over the place. And, and, and so they're quite mobile and they'll go virtually everywhere. They'll be in your pack of Sandra and then they'll go around the back of your house and they'll be in your rows. And tomorrow they'll be in the neighbor's uh, birch tree, you know, and, and so, so, so they're mobile, but, but, but what we find is there's tendencies and like, so you'll start out with smaller, uh, uh, maybe more vegetative or greener, um, uh, plants, uh, suck it more succulent plants. And as they age, they wind up, you know, on the, on the black walnuts and the tree of heaven and, and, and the red maples, you know, so, so, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't say that, that the nymphs and the adults have completely different food sources. Cause you can see here there's overlap, but, but they are moving to the trees to complete their life cycle and, uh, uh, you know, uh, and breed. So, so there may be something in the trees that that's necessary for that. Again, you know, it's, just, it, if you need a master's degree, it's, you know, something to figure out. So what we're looking at right now, are egg masses, right? And the first hatch, you know, and, and we would call that an instar. The first instar uh, happens sometime around now. Now we've seen reports from South Jersey in the agriculture areas that they're starting to hatch already. Um, there's the models called growing degree days that measure heat units that help us predict things like the hatch of certain insects and 240 growing degree days you know, is when they start to hatch. And that's usually the beginning of May, sometime around now, right? So so from May to June, this insect passes through three nymphal M stars, right? And and it grows, you know, about a, 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 a size and a half. You know, they get a little bit bigger until um, they're about a quarter inch. And then sometime in mid, late July, they molt into the fourth instar, which you can see is much bigger in red. And then we get adults sometime in late July through frost. It's got to get cold. We've seen them in December where they fly around, feed, mate, and lay eggs, right? So, so this is what we call par metabolic or gradual life change, right? And so, so uh, the eggs over winter. Um, and so here, here, here is one. This, and that's Sabrina's hand. And we found this outside the lab. And gives you a relative size. They're about an inch and a half. The wings are folded like a tent over the body. Um, you notice that it's sort of a, 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 a clay color um, with spots. Um, if you look at the wing venation up close, it almost looks like bricks are stacked. And if you look at this, notice that it's got kind of a red coloration. The, the hind wing has red markings on it. And when the wings are folded like this, it looks like the insect is glowing, right? So that's why we call it a lantern fly. And, and so, uh, um, you know, just kind of cool. Um, these things, again, uh, hold their, their head tent like over the body. I've seen explanations that the head looks like a lantern. You know, if you can think about Paul Revere holding the lantern up, um, the, the head looks like that too. Um, these things fly, but not very well. Mostly they jump and they flap a little bit and they move about 10 or 15 feet, you know? And when we went to the quarantine zones, you know, they're hopping all over you. It's, it's really kind of cool. And, and uh, um, you know, and, 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 and so they're quick too. They're hard to catch. Um, literally, it, they're, they'll, hop out, they'll hop away from you and you'll continue to try to pick one up and it'll just keep hopping away. And uh, so, so it's kind of cool. They mate, again, they mate, the adults mate in the fall, late summer and fall. What you see here on the left is what we call gravid female. 
So you see the four wings, the clay four wings, you see the red hind wings, the abdomen is yellow with black markings and you can see how swollen she is. And that means she's been fertilized and she's ready to lay eggs. And so she'll lay eggs in masses of about 30 and cover them with a, with a waxy coating right? And, and each female can lay two egg masses. So the fecundity or the total number of eggs that she can lay is somewhere, you know, around 60, 60 or 70 eggs, you know, for every one of them, right? So every female. And so, so uh, um, they'll lay eggs on virtually anything. They'll lay them on your car. They'll lay them on a wall. They'll lay them on a tree. They'll lay them a on, a on a rock on gravestones in a quarantine zone. We saw them laying eggs on, they'll lay them on anything. And that's the problem because they're going to lay them on something that you're going to drive to see your cousin in Kent, Ohio. And next thing you know, you got by the lantern fly in Ohio, you know? And so, so that, that's what makes them, makes them uh, 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 so dangerous and so spreadable. Now the freshly laid eggs, you know, the, the coatings turns, turns white. And then it, it, it the, as they age, they, it darkens up. And as we go through the winter, it starts to weather and expose. And by about now, the egg masses are starting to get exposed and, and become, you know, uh, 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 they, they, they're in a state in which they can start to hatch, right? So they're almost always lined up in parallel lines, again, up to about 30 eggs in a mass. Um, and once the wax starts to dissipate or wear weather away, they start to hatch. And then you get the first of the instars. And again, these things are highly mobile. They walk around. You see the little ones feeding on, 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 a, on a succulent or a, a green tissue. Um, they, go, they pass through three instars again from May to about July. They're hatching. Now, they all don't just hatch on May 1st. You know, they, they hatch over a period of time based on these accumulated heat units. So they're hatching already down south. Penn State has on their website has a, a tracker, an egg hatch tracker. You can put weather data or zip code information locally and it'll tell you when you, you can expect the eggs to hatch. But again, it's it's sometime now and you're not gonna notice because the, the first couple instars are really small. Um, we get up to these like half inch size fourth instars and then you start to notice these red things crawling all over the place, right? And again, you see this on a, on a grapevine. They feed with a stylet. You can see the piercing sucking mouth part. This this picture, this, this looks pretty evil right there. Um, we, we, <laughs> I'd be scared of that if it was big coming at me. And, and so they feed in the woody tissue. So the stylet is robust, you know? And so they, they, they stick that in like a straw into the wood and the turgor or the, the transpiration stream, the water moving through the xylem tissue, because they're feeding in the xylem, that's where the water moves, you know, from the soil out through the leaves, they, they feed passively. So they put the stylet in there, and, and then as water is, is sucked out into to the atmosphere, transpires, you know, through the leaves, the, the, the insect uh, uh, is, is fed. And so it, it's kind of interesting because they'll be feeding and you can hear their waste dripping out of the tree like rain, and then it'll get cloudy and that'll stop because the trees aren't transpiring enough to, to push water and, and nutrient into the insect. So, that, so that's kind of cool. You know, uh, now these guys, they make a waste product called honeydew. So honeydew is essentially xylem fluid that's pumped into the, into the insect at a rate so quick that they can't digest it quickly. Basically, it's pumped into the insect and right out the excretory pore in the back and all over everything. And it's sugar water, right? It's got some carbohydrate in it. And that's really attractive to ants and, and, and yellow jackets. It's really interesting how many, um, you know, uh, uh, bees and wasps are in the wooded areas when there's a lot of lantern flies. So, you know, that might be part of the nuisance for you. If you have a maple in your backyard and a spotted lantern flies are raining honeydew all over your deck, and then you have massive numbers of, of yellow jackets, you know, that, that might keep you inside, you know? And, and so, so again, this nuisance idea is related to the waste product that these insects make. 
And so the other thing that will happen when everything gets covered with sugar water, then a fungus grows on it and we call the fungus sooty mold. So you got this black fungal growth all over everything, all over your deck or your car or whatever, you know, your sidewalk, all your plants, the hostas or whatever that's underneath the maple are covered in sooty mold and honeydew and there's wasps flying everywhere. So you can see how it can be a, a nuisance. There's a whole, they're usually in massive groups. You know, you don't find just one, you find 10,000. Most of them are higher up in the trees that, than you see. And that goes for egg masses. 90% of the egg masses are higher than 10 feet. Um, and so, so uh, uh, you know, you might not see that you have 5,000 of them in your maple tree because they're in the top of the canopy, but you're certainly gonna know that there's honeydew or dripping all over everything. And, and again, these, these are trees that just got treated with insecticide. You see how many dead ones fell out. You know, it, it's remarkable how many of them are going to be in, in a group. So, so the question now is, you know, and, and as I kind of start to wrap this up, because I want to give Sabrina some time, um, what are we going to do about this, right? And so I made a list of some of the recommendations that we found. And, and the first thing is we don't want to move them around, respect the quarantine zones. And I'm going to elaborate on this stuff. Um, we want to destroy as many egg masses as we can. You know, we can use uh, uh, insecticidal oils to kill egg masses. So we could spray trees with, with oil to kill masses, right? We want to try to ca catch and kill as many adults and, and nymphs as we can. So there's trapping techniques that we can use. There's insecticide applications to try to kill nymphs. Um, there's insecticide applications for the adults. Um, my, a, fr a friend of mine, Brian Eschenauer in Cornell says, vacuum them up, right? And, and then, uh, you know, you see the campaign by the, the New Jersey Department of Ag to, to stomp them. So, so, so again, I'll just show you a little bit. So again, here's the quarantine zone, right? You see all the red lines, the federal quarantine zone. And what that implies is that you can't move things in and out of the quarantine zone. And, and so you must have permits to work in regulated areas and move plant material in and out of those regulated areas, right? So there are permits that professional lawn and landscape, you know, folks, people in the green industry have to have, right? And so, so you got to be permitted. And so the idea here is that spotted lantern flies can lay eggs on any surface, you know, on anything, right? And so we want to try to scrape as many of these off and kill them, scrape them in alcohol. But we also want to keep that piece of that that piece of firewood right there from moving, you know, to Kentucky, right? And so the the regulator, the things that are regulated, you know, any spotted lantern flies, you know, brush and debris, landscaping, construction waste, logs, firewood, packing materials, you know, decorative grapevines. And then outdoor household articles like campers and boats and fire pits and all of that stuff, right? Because, you know, you lay, you got your Airstream in, in, in Bergen County or in Somerset County that you're going to take down to, you know, Tennessee and you're going to carry some egg masks, right? And so we need to, we need to see that stuff and try to remove them or eradicate or not move this stuff. So again, it's all about permit permitting and regulatory stuff. Now, if you go into the New Jersey Department of Ag website, you can have checklists for homeowners, the checklists, you know, and, and so we don't want to move stuff. We can use sticky bands. So I, I'm, I just took this picture near Cranberry, New Jersey in a suburban neighborhood, ride my bike by, I look, I see, take a picture, sticky band. I mean, these things are crawling down the trees to crawl to something else, right? And they get their feet stuck. Now, the problem with this is, you know, this is really attractive to things like woodpeckers that want to eat those insects and they get stuck in the tape. So what we like you to do is use vinyl mesh screening over the tape to reduce what we call bycatch. And if you go to the Penn State websites, they'll show you how to construct stuff like this, right? And that way, that'll keep the birds and, and the non-target, the squirrels and stuff from getting their feet stuck too, right? And so we also have what we call circle traps. So circle traps is where you circle the tree with, with the vinyl mesh 
And that forces the insects up into a funnel and into a bag, into a container. And again, there, there's videos on how to do that on the Penn State website. And these things are pretty effective. And this is one, you know, I, 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 I had to go, I had to visit the hospital in Hopewell and I parked in the parking lot and there's, there's some circle traps on all the trees. And, and, and so, uh, you know, this is an effective tool um, on a small scale, right? So, so again, it's, it's something that you might consider in your own lawn and landscape. Um, there are insecticides labeled. Um, the, the NIPS, we would use these materials like Seven or Orthene or Talstar. You know, bifenthrin is in red because there's good efficacy data. It works really well. You spray the insects, you spray the plant that the insects are on and you kill them by contact. Um, you know, the, the downside of something like that is they're going to move next door. And just because you sprayed, you know, some trees doesn't mean the ones in your neighbor's yard aren't coming back into yours. It's not a really effective way of keeping, keeping them out of your, your location. Now, the next thing we have here are these neonicotinoid insecticides like Safari and Merit. And so what we would do is treat a select tree with something like that with, with Dinotefuran you can spray the trunk of the tree and it makes the whole tree toxic. So if you have a tree of heaven or, or if you have a red maple where they're congregating, you know, maybe they're congregating on a tree on that, that over overhangs your deck and they're pooing on your deck and it's a nuisance. Maybe you'll treat that tree, right? The, the downside here is these materials, these neonicotinoid insecticides are banned in New Jersey as of October 31st. Right, so we can't use them anymore. So, so killing the nymphs with with bifenthrin isn't really effective at at preventing them from your lawn, and and then the material that we might use on a select high value tree in a in a in a, in a sensitive location is getting banned. So we're not really high on the on the insecticides, you know. And a lot of tree companies, a lot of landscape maintenance companies are trying to sell your neighborhood this stuff, and we don't necessarily recommend. You know, let let the grape grower spray and let let's keep the insecticides, you know, uh, to a minimum in our landscape. You know, I, I I I'm a big fan of not spraying for aesthetics. I mean, I know it's a nuisance, but but uh, you can also get a blower or a vacuum and just vacuum up as many of them as you can. You know, that's not a bad strategy. They don't survive being vacuumed. And a uh, 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 longtime colleague Brian Eschenauer made this picture I stole from his from his blog post. And uh, um, but but again, this is a great tool. I think this is a really good tool. So you got a couple traps. You can vacuum them up if they get into your landscape. You know, you can scrape the egg masses, or you can stomp the bejesus out of all of them. You know, and uh, um, you know, and I don't know how effective that's going to be, but I guess the more that you kill, the more egg masses that you scrape, the more that you catch, the less of them you're going to have for next year. Now, that being said, if you have a bunch of them this year, you might not even see them next year. We've seen areas where there was dozens of them and haven't seen them since. So, so like, you know, they're highly mobile. They're moving around. And so, uh, um, you know, why are we going to stomp something for the sake of stomping them? And, you know, uh, uh, <laughs> I don't know if you all saw the Saturday Night Live by the Lanternfly interview but the spotted lantern fly was complaining that everybody wanted to stomp them. And so I asked myself this, you know, why do we want to kill these insects just for the sake of killing them? I think they're pretty cool. They're going to be a nuisance. They might be a nuisance in your yard. Um, vacuum them up, maybe put up a trap and, uh, and, and hope for the best. Hope the natural enemies, the birds and the entomopathogenic fungi and the viruses that get in insects catch up to these guys and reduce their populations to something that's manageable rather than something that we have to deal with. And, and so with that, it's uh, 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 just to, just to remind you, quarantine zones are important checklists. And, you know, if you have a lot of them in your yard, make sure you're not moving the eggs somewhere, scrape and destroy as many egg masses as you can just take an old credit card and scrape the egg mass into a, into a vial of alcohol you know, if you if if you have eggs and you have landscape companies, have them spray your trees with a dormant oil that'll kill the eggs. 
You have trapping tape and circle traps that are really effective. Insecticides are questionable choices in the landscape. Vacuum them up and, and you know, stomp them if you want. Uh, and so, uh, uh, you know, I, I know our State Department of Ag wants everybody to crush them, but, but uh, Spreen and I, we like them. We don't want to squish them. And so with that, um, if you if you see them, there still is a reporting website. You can go onto the State Department Ag website um, and report. Um, although at this point, we're we know they're all over the state. The whole state's in a quarantine zone, so uh, this information isn't as critical as it used to be. But we still like to keep track of where the big populations are. Um, and and so with that. Um, Thank you very much. Um, I, I left a little bit of time for my my partner, uh, uh, Sabrina, to uh, take over and tell you about some spiders. Um, you know, and I like spotted lanternflies, but I'm scared of spiders. And so with that, I'm going to stop sharing and hand hand the baton to my my partner. Thank you. Okay, thank you. My turn to share. Um, Daryl mentioned. <laughs> that I'm the red herring here to scare you about spiders. <laughs> I hope to do the opposite actually um, and allay your fears a little bit, but we'll see how that goes. I'm, I'm a little bit afraid that some of my pictures may scare some of you, uh, but I hope not. So, all right, we have a little bit of time to talk about Joro spiders. Let me make everything small. Okay, so this is the Joro spider. Um, this is a female Joro spider. This is what they look like. We're going to talk about um, their identification, a little bit about their biology, kind of where they are now, uh, things like that. Listen, as Rich mentioned, he doesn't like spiders. I'm sure there's plenty of people. I don't know if some of you don't like spiders. I can't see you. If this was in person, this would be great because I can see your faces and, and judge the fear level. Um, so I don't know where we're at. But in case you are afraid of spiders, I put this in. <laughs> this was my parents' cat. We named her Spider. As you can see, she was also a large member of her type of animal. So should you find yourself overcome by fear and panic through this talk, close your eyes and picture this spider instead. All right, so a little bit about what they look like. So it's the female uh, Joro spider that gets all the attention in the news because as you can see, she is the large one of the, uh, you know, of the pair between males and females. Her body length is about one inch in size. So not that big, but the legs, and this is my theory, the longer the legs are on an insect or spider, for some reason, the more scary they are to people. So that's my working theory. So she has a leg span of about four inches. So picture that, pretty big. Um, listen, I might have a, a different definition of pretty than you do, but I think she's kind of pretty. So she has these golden, I don't know if you can see the mouse, hopefully you can, but the cephalothorax, which is basically her head region and um, thorax together, it's covered in either golden or silvery hairs. So she's very shiny. Um, and then sort of easily recognizable by her abdomen. It's a series of yellow and sort of grayish bluish bands on the abdomen on her really super long legs which by the way, for humans, we value that, right? But like in spiders, we don't like the long legs. So for spiders, her legs are black um, and they're banded with this yellow orange coloration. Here it says that she's got a different pattern underneath and I'll show you that in, a, in the next slide, but there's an intricate, even more intricate pattern um, on her ventral surface, which is underneath. So let's see. I wish I could see your faces because how many of you would be doing this with her? This is what I meant by large. She's about four inches leg span. So basically palm size. Um, so again, I don't know how many of you would do this, but here we go, large palm size spider. So this is that intricate pattern that she has underneath. So here you can see her webbing. Um, and then underneath she has this intricate yellow and black and then red pattern as well. So should you see her from the other side of the webbing? That's what she looks like. And I was putting this talk together and I'm like, what does this remind me of? And I don't know if any of you know uh, turtles, but like red-eared slider is what's coming to me. I don't know. 
Oh, Daryl is no thanksing me. I don't know what that's about. Oh, the palm. Okay, I see it in the chat. Daryl, don't be afraid. Okay. So let's see. Next slide. So just like you learned about um, in the previous talk about spotted lanternflies, spiders also have to shed their exoskeleton in order to go through their different stages. So this is what the immature female spider looks like. So even more pronounced yellow and black banding on the legs. She still has the silver hairs on that cephalothorax, but now you can see the abdomen. I mean, I can go back. Remember the abdomen had the yellow and gray banding this way. Well, as she's going through her immature stages, she doesn't yet have that adult coloration. So she might not be, you know, if you didn't realize she might not look like the same species to you, but she is the same species. This is just, uh, she's not a full grown adult yet. And here you can see the cast exoskeleton. This is what she shed. Um, and that's what she looks like. Eventually she's gonna be that adult version. By the way, she comes from a very tiny egg then grows larger and larger. So the females are the kind of spe spectacular looking ones. They're the ones that get very large in size. Uh, the males are usually not even noticed. Um, so the male body length is only about a third, less than a third of an inch in size. Um, and as you can see, the males are not brightly colored like the females. So they're light brown and there's a couple of dark brown stripes here on the cephalothorax. And then there's like a central a darker brown stripe on the abdomen. So much smaller than the females and pretty, pretty dull colored. So basically what I'm telling you is that the males are small and dull. It's the females that are big and beautiful. So here you can see both the adult female, she's large, uh, brightly patterned, and here's an adult male of the same species. So separated, you wouldn't even realize these were the you know two of the same species, but they are. That so, remember that males are small and dull. <laughs> All right. So where did they come from? So Joro spiders, kind of similar to the spotted lantern flies that you just heard about, are also native to Asia. So they're found throughout Japan, except for the island of Hokkaido. North and South Korea, China, Taiwan, Vietnam, and India. So this, this blue region on the map is showing you their native range. In Japanese, they are called Jorogumo, which roughly translates to entangling or binding bride. <laughs> Doesn't sound appealing, right? But they kind of like these spiders over there. Uh, they have a better name. In Korean, it translates to fortune teller. I don't know the folklore there, but the Japanese folklore is that the female Joro spiders are actually shapeshifters <laughs> in that they shapeshift into a beautiful woman that kind of draws men into her spider web and then binds them and then eats them. <laughs> what I want to point out is the word that I use at the beginning of that. That is folklore. That is not what happens. They do not feed on men or women or humans at all, but that is the folklore from where they come from. So basically Asia is where they come from. Where are they now? Well, lucky for us, <laughs> we don't yet have them in New Jersey, but they are now in North America. And they were first found in fall of 2014. Um, in Georgia, and they were located in three counties in Georgia. There were some reports of people finding, you know, large spiders with large uh, webs, which we'll talk about soon in Georgia, and some entomologists and arachnologists went out, and yeah, they found these spiders. They, you know, DNA tested them, and they ended up being, well, looking at them, they looked like the spiders from Asia. Confirmation with the DNA, you know, they were, in fact, these Joro spiders. So since 2014, they've spread, you know, to throughout kind of northern Georgia, also into South and North Carolina. Um, there's a sighting in Alabama and Tennessee. Here you can see there's one in Oklahoma. Um, it's not mentioned, but there's one in Oklahoma. We think that was just an individual uh, sighting, not necessarily an established population, because if you look at Georgia and, and the Carolinas, they're, they're, you know, they have established populations there. The thing about them is similar to what you just heard about with the spotted lantern flies, they make really good hitchhikers. Um, so this was a map that I just pulled off of iNaturalist today. 
Um, so this is showing sightings based on photographic evidence of uh, Joro spiders in North America. So this one in Oklahoma, um, they think it was just an individual, you know, had one that hitchhiked on a car. She, she, she or he, I don't remember, had recently traveled from Georgia. So that's what they think that one uh, was. So one individual. This one is interesting. Um, they found they found one in a parking garage in West Virginia, and it turns out it was in the parking garage of a hotel where they were having a Southeast Wildlife Conference. And a lot of the members attending the Southeast Wildlife Conference had driven up from Georgia. Um, so they think uh, that one that was found in West Virginia, you know, came hitchhiked its way. It's kind of ironic that it came with a wildlife uh, group. Um, there's also been, apparently, I don't know much about this uh, photographic sighting in Maryland, but the photo was concert, uh, was confirmed as being a Joro spider. But again, I don't, I don't know much about it. And that was uh, last fall. So the good news is, is that through their kind of natural spread, which we'll, we'll talk about how they do that, the news likes to sensationalize things. And, you know, I don't know if you've seen headlights, headlines about these giant flying spiders and parachuting spiders and things like that. They don't fly. We'll talk about how they do kind of move. It's called ballooning. But through, through basically their kind of natural ballooning behavior, since 2014, that spread has only been about 10 miles um, per year. But what do you notice about this? It's similar to the way, uh, you know, how did they get here? Well, we think they got here similar to spotted lanternflies. We accidentally introduced them either on packing materials or potted plants or on some sort of other, you know, product. We, in the last half century, there's such an increase in global travel and trade and we move things around and inadvertently we've moved thousands of, you know, we know thousands of species that we have accidentally, you know, introduced into the US. Most, a lot of them come from Asia as well as uh, Europe. Um, so we're constantly accidentally moving things around. So. What was my point there? Oh, my point there was this long-term travel. This is not from ballooning. This is, you know, they somehow hitchhiked their way on a vehicle or so, a transportation or something like that. So yeah, they can spread by themselves, but as you can see, we're the ones that, you know, move them further, usually accidentally not knowing, you know, there's a, a sighting in Florida as well. So Daryl, before we came on, Daryl was asking, are they really, you know, can they really come to New Jersey? Yes, <laughs> hopefully it won't be anytime soon, um, you know, in terms of maybe, you know, we don't know that these are established populations in West Virginia or, or, or Maryland or anything like that. So yes, they can move very slowly by themselves. It's, it's, it's if somebody accidentally moves them that they, you know, move further distance. Okay, five minutes, let's go. Potential for further spread. Yes, I just answered this question. The way they came to North America was accidentally, we don't know how, like I said, maybe plant material, packing material, something like that. Um, they can move long distance, like I said, on you know transportation. We're gonna talk a little bit about, more about ballooning in a couple slides. Um, here's something. They're found in relatively cold areas across their native range. So in Japan, central Japan, the average temperature in January is about 25 to 32 degrees Fahrenheit. It's kind of similar you know, to our kind of normal Januaries here. So what they found is that they have really fast heartbeats, they have really fast metabolism, um, and they can survive, you know, colder areas better than some of our um, similar species that we have around here. So I'm telling you that yes, there's potential for their survival and spreading up north and for them to be able to survive in New Jersey. I, I promise you before this is over, I will get to good news. There's good news. All right, so a little bit about quickly about their life cycle. This is how they overwinter. They overwinter as eggs in this egg case. So it's this papery silk egg case. You can see the female is down here and she laid this egg case um, and they lay them similar to like the spotted lantern flies you saw either on the bark of trees or human structures, pallets or, or houses or fences that, you know, they can lay their eggs anywhere. In the spring, what hatches, what happens is that these um, eggs will hatch into Look how adorable these are. These are the little spiderlings, right? Cute little babies. I know you don't like them and there's a lot of them here. Um, so this happens in early June in Japan. So if we're sort of similar, you know, climate temperature wise, this could happen in early June here. Um, 
And, they, and what happens right away, these little guys, they balloon. So what that means is that they send off a piece of silk um, and the hot air currents will, you know, moves air and that piece of silk between the hot air currents and the drag of the silk, because they'll, they'll climb up onto some sort of little like a uh, plateau or something like top of a fence post, you know, and that they, as they rise up in the heat currents, they can be propelled uh, many, many miles, not to scare you. They're not parachuting. That makes it sound like they're invading from Mars. That's not what's happening. And by the way, these are not the only spiders that do this. We have plenty of spiders that already do this. Uh, that you may, may or may not know about. So that, that's kind of how they naturally move around. Um, this is just half a female. The females die after she lays her eggs. So this is just the body that's left over, you know, over the winter, but it's these spiderlings that will hatch in the spring. I'll have to go fast. Okay, so uh, the males will mature in late summer. This happens in about late August in Japan. The females will mature and become adults um, sometime in September to early October in Japan. We don't have published phenological data from North America yet, like, you know, when this will happen, because just like insects, spiders are very sensitive or, you know, their biological processes are, most of it is controlled by temperature and other climate factors. So what they have found in Georgia is that the females can be found as early as late August, all the way into December. Okay, here's some horrifying news, unless, you're one of those people that likes to outdo their neighbors for Halloween decorations, then this is the spider for you. The females build webs that can be 10 feet across and they usually attach them to two surfaces like a fence post and the side of a building or between trees or something like that. Yes, horrible if you're walking your dog and you don't notice it and you walk into it. I do that with our spiders here all the time. Um, but if you can see from the photo, it's a little bit hard to see that the webbing actually has a golden coloration to it if that makes you feel better, it's a giant sticky web. So don't walk into it, but you know, hire them for Halloween. So you noticed I called it the female web. Let's think back to a few minutes ago when I told you that the male spiders were um, small and dull. Well, they're also lazy <laughs> because the male spiders don't build a web. They hang out in the female webs. So the females build the webs, the males hang out. So here you can see a female with like three different males. So you can see the size difference as well. Um, and what happens is that by the fall, the males and females will mate. The females then go and lay one, each female lays one individual egg case. You're like, oh, okay, great. They just lay one. Well, there's about 400 to 500 eggs in this tiny egg case. And then uh, with the onset of winter, both the adult male and female will die. And we go back to the beginning with the egg cases that will hatch in the following spring. Very quickly, just wanna show you that we do have some similar species here in North America. Um, the golden silk orb weaver, this was the only species within this genus that we had in North America prior to the Joro spiders being introduced in 2014. So these guys are similar in size. Well, I should say ladies. These ladies are similar in size uh, to the Joro spiders. You can see there's a different pattern. They're orange with yellow spots. They do have the silvery cephalothorax. But look at this. They're going back to the 80s. They have fuzzy leg warmers. Look at them, adorable, huge, but adorable. So again, they're more prevalent in the Southeast, but we do occasionally find them in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and things like that. Another one you might be familiar with are these yellow and black garden spiders, the Argiopes. Um, so this species you can see looks different. They're much smaller in size. Their leg span's only about two and a half uh, inches in size, but the pattern's different. They're black and yellow on the abdomen. The abdomen is much more round than cylindrical. Um, what I do want to point out is this zigzag pattern in the webs. I don't know if you've ever seen these large, you know, webs that these orb weavers make. This zigzag pattern is called the stable momentum. Us humans don't really know the function of this stable momentum, but the Joro spiders adults never make this zigzag pattern. So should you see a large web with a zigzag pattern, it's not a Joro spider. Um, and one more is the banded garden spider, also another large spider in the same family. And we have these around here as well. And you can see they look vastly different. Um, I promise you we're getting to the good news in a second. Okay, so what's their impact? Well, we still don't know. They're an introduced species into the US, into North America in 2014. So like, they're spiders. Spiders eat are generalized predators that feed on any insects that they catch, basically. So are they going to, that being said, they're going to, you know, they're going to feed on some of our native insects. Will they feed on enough of them to make really any difference? We don't know. 
the other concern is, will they outcompete and displace native spider species? Again, they haven't been here long enough. We don't have enough information um, to really know that for sure yet. Okay, here's the good news that I promised. They're docile in nature, I promise you. They don't want to bite you. They're not an aggressive spider and they're not jumping at you like some of the other ones. So they're very docile in nature. The fantastic news is, and I like this word, their fangs are puny, very small. They have very, they have trouble getting through human skin. So it's difficult for them. So, but even if they could bite you, their venom is very weak. Um, so it's not, it's not considered medically relevant. So they're not quote unquote poisonous to humans in that way. So they, they can barely bite if at all possible and their venom is very weak. And a kind of an interesting piece of, you know, think about it is that they're native to the same areas in Asia as the spotted lantern flies and remember brown marmorated stink bugs. How can we forget? Um, those are both native to Asia and a lot of our native spiders don't like to feed on them. However, these guys came from the same place, right? So they probably have no problem feeding on some of these other, you know, introduced invasives. So just to end it, listen, spiders are good. <laughs> Don't be afraid. These especially cannot, can't even bite you. Um, in general, spiders are generalist predators of other insects. We oftentimes consider them beneficial, the good guys. They are also important food sources for other animals, right? This is just spiders in general. A lot of spiders are also pollinators. Everybody loves the honeybee, and then we forget about the little crab spider. Um, and then there, you know, there's medically important applications to their venom and their silk, which is very strong. So with that, I just want to say thank you. And if you have any questions, um, this is a photo from one of our students in the turf school in the fall. I found out that he lived in Georgia. I knew I had this talk coming up. I didn't think anybody was going to pay me to go down to Georgia to take my own pictures of these spiders. So I asked to see if he had any, and, and this is one he sent me. And I thought, oh, this is great. And then I put it up here and I thought, oh, this makes it look like they're the size of a window. This is scary. <laughs> they're not the size of a window. This is just the angle they're hanging in front of the house. And then just to end it on a completely ludicrous note, this was my spider costume I made about 20 years ago. So at <laughs> that point, I was the largest spider found in New Jersey. <laughs> and now I'm ending it. <laughs> <laughs>